Welcome to Doing the Work, the frontline stories of social change, where we bring you stories of real people working to address real issues. I am your host, Shimon Cohen. I'm excited to let everyone know about the Doing the Work collection in partnership with Things Social Workers Say. We've got hoodies, tees, mugs, and tote bags. Now you can rep the podcast you love while you're doing the work. Check out the link in the show notes and head on over to the store. Thanks for supporting this work. In this episode, I talk with Anjanette Young, who is a licensed clinical social worker and the CEO and founder of Cafe Social Work in Chicago, Illinois. Anjanette shares her experience of being terrorized in her home by the Chicago Police Department. Twelve white male police officers forced their way into her home when executing a warrant based on incorrect information, handcuffed her, and held her at gunpoint for 30 to 45 minutes, all the while Anjanette was naked because she had just gotten out of the shower after a long day at work. Despite her pleas that they were in the wrong home, all of them ignored her. An excellent lawyer and local news station helped expose the horrific raid and eventually forced the city to release the body cam footage, as well as evidence showing that the Chicago mayor knew about the raid and covered it up. Anjanette explains how this experience has led her to learn more about the Chicago Police Department's repeated violation of the rights of black and brown Chicago residents and how she is now fighting the city of Chicago in order to make sure this does not happen to anyone else. She talks about how she has mainly practiced direct service social work for over 25 years, but has now become a social justice activist focused on policy change. I hope this conversation inspires you to action. Before we get into the interview, I want to let you all know about our episode's sponsor, the University of Tennessee Knoxville College of Social Work. First off, I want to thank them for sponsoring the podcast. UTK has a phenomenal social work program with the opportunity to do your bachelor's, master's, and doctorate of social work online. Of course, they also have excellent classes in person in both Knoxville and Nashville. UTK is committed to preparing social workers who will support human potential and dignity and challenge racism and all forms of oppression. Scholarships are available. Go to www.csw.utk.edu to learn more. And now, the interview. Hey, Anjanette, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. I'm really, you know, I've been really looking forward to talking with you about your experience and your current approach to social work based on your experience. So I just want to welcome you to the podcast. Well, Shimon, thank you so much for just reaching out and connecting and becoming a um, partner in the social work work that we do. And um, I'm really excited to be on um, the podcast with you and um, just share with your listeners um, my wisdom in uh, in social work and my wisdom in my new role as a social justice activist. Sounds great. You know, and before we get into all that, I just want to ask, you know, how are you? Like, how are you doing? Um, it's really, it's really day by day. So today was a pretty good day. Nothing um, too crazy is happening. But overall, I'm doing okay. Um, it's a tough journey. Mm-hmm. You know, having an experience that um, traumatizes you, you know, from a, a system that you totally expect to protect you is really hard. And so um, I'm dealing with it day by day. So today I'm okay. Well, I'm glad today's good. And I should also put out there that we're recording this in early March, and this is going to go live in April. And so I know a lot can also change between now and then. Um, So, you know, we'll try to update that by linking people um, to your story and to your case but hopefully people listening will then also go and look it up on their own, you know, and, and stay current on what's going on. Yeah, absolutely. There, um, There's a lot in the media right now regarding um, Anjanette Young. If you Google or, you know, on Twitter and Facebook and all of the social media uh, platforms, 
there's been a lot of stories that have been um, surfacing around my experience with the Chicago Police Department. Yeah. So let's talk about your experience. You know, of course, you've shared this in so many places and you've been so incredibly vulnerable with this experience. And, you know, as much as you as you feel comfortable, if you could let people know about your experience with the Chicago police. Sure. So back in 2019, February of 2019, um, I had an experience where the Chicago Police Department raided my home um, with bad information. They had the wrong place. They had um, information that was not accurate that led them to my door. And in that process, it was just very horrific in the way that they treated me in that process. So they, you know, rammed in my front door, came in with guns and, you know, lights and scopes. And I had um, been home all of about 15 or 20 minutes, had un- was undressing to just kind of unwind my day. And they bust into my home and yell, you know, Chicago Police Department, put your hands up. And I was completely naked. I didn't have on any clothing at the time. And they uh, went forth with what it is that they thought they were there to do. And so in the process of that, I'm standing there with no clothes on, completely naked. They handcuffed me. They they raid my home. They searched my home. And the entire time I'm I'm yelling and I'm screaming and I'm crying to them, telling them that they have the wrong place. And what's most um, horrific about this is just the way they treated me. So they ignored everything that I said. They were yelling at me. They made me stand in front of them with no clothes on for over 35, 40 minutes and and never told me why they were in my home until much later. And so it's just been a very horrific experience. Thank you for being so vulnerable and and sharing about it. I mean, I saw the body cam footage, you know, that when it went public and that's how I learned about you and that's how, you know, soon after that we connected. Um, But that, that foot, that body cam footage, right. That didn't even go public, you know, until a year, a little over a year after after the raid. Correct. And what, uh, what is, um, for me right now, the worst part of this situation is that the city initially never admitted that they did anything wrong to me. Mm. So this incident happened February 21st, 2019. And I immediately hired an attorney and began to legally, uh, fight the process of what they had done to me. And um, they just kind of brushed it under the rug like it it didn't go anywhere. My attorney reached out to the city, you know, made some, you know, filed some motions and some complaints for the city to talk to us about what happened. And they just denied the entire process. And then a few months later, in November of that same year, CBS2 in Chicago, a local news station, had already begun to do a series regarding the wrong raids in the city of Chicago. So this had been happening to so many families for so many years. And CBS2 was doing a story about it. And so uh, my attorney and I decided to reach out to them um, to add my, my story to the process of what they were already working on. And so we did a story in 2019 and it just kind of made local news like it hit the news and it made local news, but it didn't make national news as this uh, last story did. Yeah. And, you know, I want to get back to when when you're home, you're in your own home, you've been working all day as a social worker, doing what you've been doing for 25 years. They bust into your home. At that moment, I mean, I don't want to obviously put feelings onto you, but that has to be one of the most terrifying experiences, right, a person could ever go through. Absolutely. For me, it was my first encounter with the police in that manner. So I'm a person, you know, I like to say, you know, I kind of like go to work every day, mind my own business. 
um, and, and don't live the type of lifestyle where I would have a negative encounter with the police. So have I been pulled over for a speeding ticket before? Absolutely. Uh, but that's probably the most interaction that I've personally had with police. And so for this to happen in, in the way that it did, it's hard to describe, right? So you, if, when you watch the, the body cam footage, um, it tells a better story than I can describe because often I'm lost for words to explain what I was really feeling on that night. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to tell people that I was scared. I was afraid. I wasn't sure what was happening because no one was explaining to me what was going on. I didn't understand why they had to put me in handcuffs. I didn't understand why they wouldn't allow me to get dressed. And so it's, it's hard to put in words what I was feeling that night even when I watch the body cam footage, um, it's hard to hear my own voice and the horror and the terror that's in my voice. I tell people, for me, the sound of the body cam footage um, was worse than actually the the visual of the body cam footage. Mm. And, you know, hearing my own voice and hearing, you know, the terror in my voice is is more than I can describe. Yeah, and I've you know I've heard you talk about, and when we've talked before, you've shared you know you feel like you were one instance away from being murdered like Breonna Taylor. Absolutely, because of the way they came in and they had big guns and they were pointing them at me and they were shouting at me. I tell people that. Um, I was scared into compliance, like I was too afraid to move or do anything beyond just stand there with my hands up. And I absolutely felt in that moment, had I done anything different, that they would have shot me. Um, I, I feared for my life. I, I didn't know what to do other than to just stand there in the nude with my hands up in the air. Yeah, and I know in, in the video they like, eventually put a blanket over you and because you're handcuffed and they don't right do anything to secure the blanket it's like falling off throughout that whole time yeah so um they did put a blanket around me and and like you said they they put it around my shoulders and because i was handcuffed i wasn't able to hold it or secure it myself so it continued to slide off and it's just for me, when I watch that part of the video, it's one of those things where there was no intention or purpose in protecting me in any type of way. I feel like it was it was just a gesture like, let's put this around her. But the entire time they stood directly in front of me. Well, one officer behind me who handcuffed me and then the rest of them standing around me and directly in front of me, you know, talking to me and yelling at me. And the whole time the blanket is open and I'm exposed to them. And they are not even considering the fact that I'm standing there with no clothes on. It's absolutely horrific and must have been an incredibly dehumanizing feeling. Um, absolutely. I, I tell people all the time that one of the biggest takeaways from this for me is feeling ignored. The officers ignored me, you know, the night that they came into my home. They didn't listen to me when I, I told them over 43 times that they had the wrong place. They ignored me when I asked to get dressed. They ignored me when I asked them to tell me what they were looking for in my home. They ignored me when I asked to see the search warrant. And then my understanding, right, is that they ignored you when you tried to get the body cam footage, too. So that is correct. And after I hired an attorney and we started the legal process, the city ignored me even more with my request for the body cam footage. The um, Channel 2 News that was doing the story, they... Um, submitted a FOIA request, which they have every right to as the media. And that request was denied for them, stating that 
Um, it was um, personal information for me and that they couldn't share that with the media. So then I made a personal request for your request. They denied me the four year request stating that it was an ongoing investigation. So I wasn't allowed to have that information either, which in both instances was was incorrect. They should have released that information both to CBS2 and the media when they requested it. And then also they should have released it to me when they requested it, when I requested it. But they didn't on either side. My attorney later had to request the body cam footage through a legal proceeding. And is is the the body cam footage released? That's what really got the national attention going, correct? Correct. So CBS2 did the original story back in November of 2019. It took us an entire year to get that body cam footage because the next story didn't come out until December of 2020, mm-hmm. where we then had the body cam footage and was able to take some time to review it ourselves because it was quite a bit of footage and then also um, prepare it for it to be shown in the media. So it, we had to hire someone to digitally um, screen out certain parts of the video so that it, we could show it in the news media. And so it was a, a year later that we got all of that information and was able to do an additional story, which is the story that pretty much everyone has seen at this point that aired in December of 2020. Yeah. And can you also talk about the mayor and how she's handled the whole situation? So the mayor has not been very responsive to me. And it's another part of me continuing to feel like being ignored in this process. Because then when the story came out in November of 2019, the mayor was made aware of it at that point. And um, we later have found out that there was a chain of emails that went back and forth between the mayor and people in her department and the superintendent of the police department as it relates to the story when it came out in 2019. And they didn't do anything about it in 2019. And then when the story aired in in 2020 and the mayor saw it and was asked about it she denied that she knew anything about it and over a three-day period of news media happening she changed her story because she was being called out on information that she lied about so she lied about that she had never seen the story and then the next day she came back and say um i did have information about it And she mentioned that someone had emailed her about it. So then she got called out and said, well, and the public asked to see those emails. And because she's the mayor, that's public information because the the public pays her her salary. So she was forced to release emails that she and different people in her department had um, sent back and forth regarding it. And we found out that there was over 150 pages Hmm of emails about this situation back in 2019 and she never did anything about it. All those emails about you. All those emails about me and the raid that happened on my home. And it was a year later that we found out that she had the email. She had firsthand knowledge of it and she didn't do anything to address the issue. So Anjanette, you know, you've been a social worker a long time and I'm I'm sh- and we'll talk about it and I'm sh- you know I can imagine during that time you've been there and you've su- you've helped so many people and now you're in you're in this situation with this incredibly traumatic experience and like how what does your healing process look like So my my professional background definitely gave me an advantage to knowing what I needed for my healing process so I was, uh, I connected with a therapist and um, started to do the work as it relates to my experience. I like to tell people because I'm a woman of faith that, you know, my prayer life and my, my relationship with God and my spirituality is a key, you know, component to me being able to heal mm-hmm. or in the healing process. 
My church has been an extremely supportive um, space for me. In my church, um, I I get guidance from my pastor, and um, and and spiritually, I'm able to um, connect. And then I also volunteer in my church, so serving others also gives me a sense of um, healing and purpose. Is being able to not focus on myself, but but um, help someone else takes the focus off me and that helps the healing process also. And with my therapist, I I always say to her that I don't want to own the title of of being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress, Mm -hmm. although that's what it is. I like to say that I I have post-traumatic stress moments Mm -hmm. where I'm triggered by certain things because of this incident loud noises in the middle of the night, police sirens, you know, even the sight of a cop car um, increases my anxiety when I'm out in the community now because of this situation. Um, But my social work experience and education and wisdom that I've learned over the years helps me to know what I'm feeling when I feel it, right? So for a lot of people, Wendy or anxious or have, you know, racing heartbeats or heart palpitations, not necessarily knowing what is causing that because of my experience in the, the work that I've done, I know what I'm feeling when I feel it. So then I know how to self-regulate. As we're just talking and again, like when we first connected, you know, I'm I'm just in awe of your ability to um, get through this, you know, I'm sure it's not like you said at the beginning, right? It's day by day, right? It's absolutely day by day. And I tell people that I can't say that I'm over it. I don't know that I would ever be over it. Mm -hmm. And I, and there are moments that I cry myself to sleep at night. That's just being honest. And, and I have to take time to feel what I'm feeling and I have to take time to, to pray and to, you know, find my quiet spaces so that I can get up the next morning and function. One thing that I have committed myself to in this process is that I will not allow this experience to defeat me. I will not allow it to take away the joy that I have in being a social worker and helping other people. Um, I will not allow it to take away the joy that I have in just being the person who I've always been. And actually this experience has um, pushed me into a direction of being a social activist now, because I know what happened to me has happened to other families I know that I have been blessed in my experience to have an amazing attorney and a um, large support system through my family and friends and my church. And I know that that's not always the experience of everyone who who has had this experience. So I'm committed to fighting for justice for myself and justice for others in the sense that with my fight with the city, I'm asking for policy changes and reform and legislation in the way that they operate and the way that the city of Chicago Police Department interact with um, black and brown families, because we know this doesn't happen in white communities. Exactly. That was something I wanted to ask you about is how you've connected with other families who've been you know, raided, victimized by the police? So I have a desire to do that, but because I have an active legal case, I'm not allowed to connect directly with them at this time. But it is definitely my desire in my fight that I acknowledge that I'm not doing this just for myself. And at some point when um, when it's not conflicting with my legal case, I will absolutely personally connect with those other families. You know, it's like you're, 
it's that social worker right part of of you too where you've gone through this this is such a personal and individual experience but you know it happens it's ha- it has happened to so many others and so you're going to do this work for for not just you but for others as well right like as you said this transformation into um a social justice activist can you kind of talk about that process of like what what your social work's been like for 25 years and now where you're head like what you're doing now and where you're headed so the last 25 years before this incident my social work practice and experience has been direct practice work working directly with families you know helping to problem solve you know social issues helping families to deal with um, mental health challenges that they may have in their family. So I've always been a direct practice social worker, not heavily into advocacy and social justice. You know, I would definitely say that I've, I've been involved in some marches and, you know, signed some petitions to support a certain policy, but all my work has always been directly with families. This experience has changed that for me. I tell people that before this, I was a pretty quiet person. Not a lot of people knew my name and I was okay with that. I I just enjoyed the one-on-one work with families. I enjoyed, you know, doing my best to work for families and going home to a quiet house. I wasn't big on social media before this. And this incident has exploded in a way that I've become this public figure that I'm now learning how to utilize that. This is a new space for me. And um, I was having a conversation with someone this morning for something else that I'm going to be doing in the future. And I say that when this all came out in the media in 2020, um, I did a lot of interviews. So I interviewed with with Gail King, with um, Soledad O'Brien, um, Joy Reid. I mean, everybody wanted you know me to sit down with them, and that was a very new experience for me also. And it was it was hard many days to do those interviews because it was so fresh. But back in January of this year, on MLK Day, my church and I put on a rally, a social justice rally. And when I spoke at that rally, I tell people that's the moment I found my voice. Hmm. When I spoke to the crowd that day, I felt empowered. And since that time, I've been committed to fighting for myself and for others and pushing the city on reform issues. That's so powerful. I mean, the city really, and they really messed with the wrong woman there, you know, cause I know I've been following and it's like, you are, you're not just taking the money, right? Cause that's what Chicago has historically done is they've done this over and over and over to black and brown families in folks and communities. And then they do payouts, right? Like huge tax dollar payouts and you're like you're pushing for you're pushing for like bigger change and they really messed with the wrong woman they did so shimon i tell i like to tell people so some of my my personal background my grandmother was a civil rights activist in mississippi Mm. and she raised me in mississippi i lived in mississippi until age 25 and i grew up watching my grandmother go to marches and rallies and fight for voter rights. And my grandmother marched with Dr. King. And I think that's part of the reason why I went into social work, but not so much for the social justice issue, just that my grandmother raised me to, to, to serve others and to, to be a help to others whenever you could. I now see that I am like finding my voice in from all that I learned from her all of those years ago when I watched her um, fight with, you know, the civil rights movement. And so I tell people that between my, my, my civil rights, you know, foundation from my grandmother, 
Um, and being a woman of God who believes that God has given me this experience to do something bigger with it than myself and being a social worker is a trifecta uh, that the city of Chicago is not ready for. And absolutely, they did mess with the wrong person. Yeah, it, you've got some serious powers there, right? Yes, absolutely. And so I'm going to continue to fight. And and as you mentioned, with you know, with the city of Chicago, they you know harm families, and then they offer a payout. And unfortunately, most families take it for a variant of reasons. Some people just don't want the the struggle of fighting with the city. Some people are living in poverty, so the the payout is very enticing to them, and they know that it can make a difference in their lives and their family lives, so they take the payout. Mm -hmm. And then there are some people who don't feel that they're strong enough or feel like they have the resources to fight the city. And I've been blessed to be in that situation. Financially, I'm no millionaire, but I do okay. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I have an amazing attorney that I was able to connect with. And I have the support of my church, which is a really large um, support system. And so the city is, I'm, I'm fighting the city. They can't pay me off with, you know, a few dollars and sweep this under the rug. The, the city, I like to say, swept this under the rug for two years. They hid it. They didn't want to talk about it. They hid the emails. They, they tried to sanction my attorney and the media when they was uh, when the story was about to come out they didn't want the story to come out and there are so many things that my attorney has um revealed and exposed the city on that they've been hiding with my case from the very beginning so we're going to keep pushing i uh, it's been 2 years and it's not easy and there are days that I'm tired of fighting and, and then I'm reminded that with the civil rights movement, it didn't happen overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, my uncle um, tells me all the time about my grandmother and and how, she, you know, there were times that she was tired, but she continued to fight and that I have, you know, big shoes to feel and I have strong shoulders to stand on. And so I'm just going to continue this fight no matter how long it takes. The recent situation, and this is where, you know, things could change by the time the episode goes live, right, is that you've got a lawsuit, right, going against the city, and then just recently they've announced, like, some reforms, but I know you've also been critical of those, ref of what they're announcing, so can you speak about that? I can speak about that a little bit. So, yes, uh, my attorney and I, we have filed a formal lawsuit against the city of Chicago, um, and so we'll see, you know, where that goes. And then the city council of Chicago, there are aldermen that are on the city council who support me. And so we put out an ordinance that we're calling the Anjanette Young Ordinance, where we're asking for specific um, changes in legislation as it relates to how the city conducts raids in black and brown communities. So the mayor decided that she would come out before our before my ordinance can be approved in legislation, that she would come out with some very similar reforms. In my opinion, she was doing that as a way to kind of quash the ordinance that we are fighting for. But those um, reforms that she has put out are, are very surface and they really don't address the problem. There are no real um, policies in place as to address what she calls accountability. She speaks of, you know, with these new uh, reforms that she's putting in place, that officers will be held accountable. But it doesn't say what that accountability will be. It doesn't say that officers will be punished or disciplined. It just says that they will be held accountable. Yeah, and this is the this is the issue, right? With police misconduct, police um, brutality, police killing um, all across the country is time and time again, there is zero accountability. And so they are allowed to keep acting this way with impunity, right? With no, there's just, they never have to face the music, so to speak, 
about their behavior, about their policies, about their practices. Absolutely. So with the incident that I had, there were 12 officers, 12 white men who um, I encountered that night. And what we've now found out with filing our lawsuit is that five of them um, are repeat offenders. Mm. And so even before I had my incident with them, they had done this multiple times and yet they're still working and they still have their badges and they still have their pensions and they continue to be available to go out in these raids and get it wrong and traumatize families in the process. Yeah, it's just absolutely horrific. The person, right, that they were after was actually on an ankle monitor and they could have found where he was if they really um, did their their due diligence to, to figure that out as well, correct? Correct. And we found so found out that, and not in just my story or my incident, but in multiple incidents where they've raided the wrong home, the person that they were looking for was either already incarcerated or never had lived at that address. Or, you know, for me, the person had never lived at the address, but was on an ankle monitor that was assigned to an address that was a few doors down. And so it, it our research has shown that they're not doing very much on the front end to make sure that they have the right information before they bust down someone's door. Right. And then that is where it gets connected back to they're not busting down doors in in of white families. Absolutely. So they're not kicking in doors or busting down doors in white neighborhoods and they're not treating, you know, people of, you know, white women or white men in the same regard as they do when they, when they kick down these doors in black and brown communities, pointing guns at children, you know, terrorizing people, you know, ripping through people's home even in my incident, one of the um, videos that we watch, the guy points a gun at my dog and tells my dog, don't move. Mm. And my dog is a small Yorkie that's all of eight pounds, you know, so they have no regard, you know, for the the family or the person's home who they are um, interacting with at all. And it's so oxymoron for them to drive in cars and wear badges and uniforms that says protect and serve when they are doing nothing in their actions with these raids that protect or serve the families' homes who they've gone into. Yeah, like who's protecting these families from the police who are supposedly there to protect and serve? Absolutely no one. And that's why I'm fighting to say that this is not okay. And I'm fighting to say you have to be different. You have to be human. And, I, and I've said on several occasions, it's one thing to get it wrong. Accident happens. You know, things fall through the crack. But once you get on the other side of that door, how you interact with that person matters. How you interact with that person should not only be a part of your training, but also should be a part of you being human and seeing the other person as someone who is human and deserves dignity and respect. Yeah. You know, one of the things that, I mean, so many things about um, what happened to you when I watched it, um, when it first came out, you know, really stood out to me. But one thing is like, you're in there trying to, um, You're in your home explaining to them, like, you've got the wrong home, right? Like, you're repeatedly saying, you've got the wrong home, and you're obviously terrified, and and you're saying it, um, and and you sound the way you you feel. Like, it's very clear, and I'm not sure who it was, if it was, like, a captain or a sergeant, you know, I don't know what their title is, but he repeatedly tells you to calm down. Absolutely. There's a moment... I remember this moment, but I also in watching the video, I'm yelling at him about, you know, you have the wrong place. You have the wrong place. What is going on? You know, can you please tell me what you're looking for? And he says on multiple occasions, ma'am, you just need to calm down. And there was a moment of frustration for me um, where I yell at him and I curse like, 
why, you know, how am I supposed to F and come down when you have just kicked in my door and you're in my home and I'm telling you, you have the wrong place. So even to the point of him feeling that it was appropriate to tell me to calm down in a very chaotic moment where the chaos they've caused. Mm -hmm. And now he wants me to calm down and have a conversation with him. Yeah. It's, it's just so unbelievable, but it's believable because it happens and it happens all the time. You know, unfortunately, I mean, not unfortunately, we could argue that this is even that this is, this is their, this is business as usual for them. What I found in my, in this experience and fighting this experience is how deep rooted the corruption is in the city of Chicago. I've lived in Chicago over, my son is 25. So about 25 years now I've lived in Chicago as an adult and you hear the stories about city corruption and, you know, politics and, you know, mayors and bad cops. But I've had a firsthand experience on how deep rooted the corruption is in the city of Chicago. And it amazes me how deep it goes. Um, And it amazes me that in 2021, we continue to live in a city that allows for corruption under a African-American mayor under an African-American police superintendent that does not respond in a way that would help the black and brown community. Right. So it's not just about diversity and inclusion. Absolutely not. And, um, and I, and when I had a conversation, I had a personal conversation with the mayor, a one-on-one, just myself and my attorney and her and one attorney. And I said to her, what accountability looks like for me is actually changing the rules from the bottom up. And what I said to her is that you can put policy in place at the, you know, top level and, and you can, you know, have these, these policies and rules in place, but the people on the bottom, the, the boots on the ground, the officers who, who are going into the home If there is not a cultural change and shift within them, the policy is just a piece of paper that goes in a file cabinet, Hmm. right? The officers who are the ones that are interacting with the public have to have a commitment to want to change the deep rooted culture of the Chicago Police Department. What do you think it's going to take for that type of commitment? Because in the city of Chicago is so deep rooted, the culture shift will take time. However, I think with the experience that I've had and the experience that the city is going to have with me, that it will begin to make the change. Even if I'm able to uproot one part of the corruption in the city of Chicago, that's a win. That's a win um, to move us in, to move the needle forward, to move us in the right direction. But it's going to take commitment from every level, from activists like myself to the officers who walk the beat, to the commanders who, um, you know, do the roll call and give instructions before officers go out, to the superintendent and the mayor and every and the governor and the senator and the legislature. Everyone has to be committed to the change in order for there to be real change. Mm-hmm. What do you think of, um, you know, some of the calls that are out there and also other cities? Because um, the, this happens right all all over the country mm-hmm. for just there to be, you know, an end to no knock raids. So it's interesting that you asked that question because we just had this conversation as it relates to the ordinance that we are pushing forward in my name. And then the city came out with their policy reform as it relates to the warrant. So it's one thing to say that we're not going to have no not warrants. So no not warrants means that when the when the parade team comes to your home, 
they can just hit the door and automatically come in. That's what a no knock warrant is. But a warrant that I, that requires you to knock is mean, means that you should knock at the door and allow for someone to come to the door and speak to them and then, you know, then conduct your search warrant. What we're find, what I've found in my experience and, and other experiences as it relates to the city of Chicago, and when you watch the body cam footage from the night that they entered my home, they knocked on the door, mm. but they knocked and then hit. So they're knocking, but they're not allowing uh, the person time to come to the door. So it doesn't matter if the warrant is knock or no knock, if they're just going to bust in as soon as they arrive. So you'll see on the body cam footage where they do a quick knock, 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 Chicago Police Department, and then immediately slams the door with the battering ram. So there, there is no distinction between the two if the officers aren't going to actually follow through with what it means to knock on the door and allow someone to answer. Yeah, I really appreciate you speaking to that because I think also a lot of people who are going to, who will be listening, you know, that's something they'll see. Cause that's one of the things you first see when you start like learning about this, right. Is these calls to, for an end to the no knock. But if they're just getting around that by a quick knock and then boom, the door goes down, you know, it, it, it's the same situation. It absolutely is the same situation. And I'm learning that from my own personal experience and even watching the body cam footage from the night that they entered my home, because you do see them knock on the door and then you see them immediately hit the door as well. So it's it's moot, it's a moot point to say to no longer have no knock warrants if they're just going to knock and hit on the door and don't give people an opportunity to respond. And I've said to um, others in other I've said in other interviews that I've done is because of the type of person that I am who have never really had any experiences negative or positive with the police department being at my home door that had they knocked on the door and allowed me to, you know, get dressed and answer it. I would have let them come in and would have, you know, had a conversation with them. Who are you looking for? I don't know that person. You want to look around? Sure. Look around. I would have allowed that if they would have given me an opportunity to do so because I had nothing to hide and I knew that the person that they were looking for was not anyone that I was associated with. Mm -hmm. So for people who are listening, how can they support the work you're doing? You know, how can they get involved if they want to? What are, what are some next steps there? So if you're in the city of Chicago in or in the state of Illinois, and you want to support or get involved, the, um, there will be probably in a couple of weeks, by the time this airs in April, there will be a petition um, to move forward the Anjanette Young Ordinance, which in the ordinance, we're asking for specific um, legislation and policy change as it relates to how the city of Chicago does um, search warrants in people's homes. And you can you can follow follow me on my social media to hear more about that. I am Anjanette Young on all of the social media platforms. You can find me um, there. And so I would say follow me and um, share what I'm sharing and, you know, speak to your local legislative um, about the petition and about the ordinance that we're trying to push forward. Um Feel free to reach out to me on any social media platform. I'll have a conversation with you. If you have ideas or you just want to support, I absolutely encourage it. Yeah, and I'll put the links to your social media sites on the show notes and on the Doing the Work website as well with this episode so people can you know, click right there to get that as well. And what about folks outside of Chicago and outside of Illinois? Um, people who are outside of Chicago, Illinois, I would say keep keep it in the news, share the stories, um, you know, all around, you know, share, you know, what's happening here in Chicago. Um, we're, you know, this is a national story now. So talk about it. Um, my company, Cafe Social Work, I work with um, new social workers across all 50 states. And so I provide tutoring and mentoring and coaching for new social workers. 
social workers who are preparing for their licensure exam. I provide tutoring and coaching for that. And you can find me at cafesocialwork.com as it relates to those services. And so I uh, would encourage people to check me out on my website. Yeah, definitely. I hope people will, you know, and it's just incredible that you're still doing all of that while you're going through this. <laughs> I mean, you, you're, you have, you are so powerful. Well, thank you for that. It is not easy, but the work that I'm doing with my business was very intentional that I didn't allow that to this situation to get in the way. So I started my company, like I physically launched my company in March of 2019, just a couple of weeks after this incident happened. Wow. So when this incident happened in February of 2019, I was a few weeks away from launching my business. And so just, you know, deep into the work, right? Getting stuff put together, websites and print materials and marketing and all of these things. And then this incident happens like a couple of weeks before my lunch. And it stifled me for a little bit, but then I was committed to not allow it to get in the way. So I launched my business anyway, and I've been very focused on, you know, building my business and my business is now two and two years old. The beauty of it is doing this work, helping other people actually allows me and gives me comfort. And it allows my attorney to do what he needs to do on the legal side. And I can keep some, what, some part of my life normal. Yeah. You've really taken a horrific experience and transformed it into a catalyst for change, you know, in a way that, like you said, you were not focused on before this happened. And I just think that's phenomenal. Well, thank you. I would like to think that my grandmother, who she passed away some years ago, but I would like to think that she's very proud of the work that I'm doing right now. And she is definitely the shoulders that I stand on. She's definitely my strength in the moments when I'm weak and I cry myself to sleep at night. It's it's her that keeps pushing me and guiding me and giving me the strength that I need to do this work. Yeah, that that's amazing. You know, and I I want the social work prof you know, I want the whole social work profession and um beyond the social work profession to to know about you, to follow what you're up to, to support you, to um really look to you as someone who's a leader um in our larger community of social workers. And so that's, you know, all part of why I wanted, you know, I'm so glad we connected and you were able to come on here. Um, and just before we, you know, wrap up, is there anything else, you know, you want to say while you've, while you've got the mic? Um, I want to say thank you. Um, the one thing that I can say about this experience, as bad as it has been, I have not really experienced any negative pushback from anyone. And we know how the public can be sometimes. And so I've received nothing but support and love from the larger community, the social work community, and then the larger community as a whole. And um, and I'm grateful for that. I'm thankful for the support. I'm thankful for the kind words. I'm thankful that people can see my pain and my experience and empathize with me in a way that allows me to fight this fight another day or for a little bit longer. Yeah. And I mean, I, I'm so grateful, number one, that you're here, right? That you're still here. <laughs> um, and that you and I have connected that you that you came on here and that, you know, and, and that you're doing the work in the community, you know, I always like, cause this is called doing the work. So I always like to end by saying, you know, with the guests saying, you know, thank you for doing the work in the community. Cause the world is a better place. The community is a better place, you know, directly thanks to the work you're doing. Thank you for allowing me an opportunity to speak to your community. 
Thank you for creating, developing, and continuing to guide this podcast. It's needed. And um, I appreciate that I can have a moment to share my story, but also have a moment to appreciate you and your community for all of the work that's being, being done. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Doing the Work, Frontline Stories of Social Change. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please follow on Twitter and leave positive reviews on iTunes. If you're interested in being a guest or know someone who's doing great work, please get in touch. And thank you for doing real work to make this world a better place. Thank you.